Hello and welcome to Sidelines, an inside look at Cornell Athletics. I'm David Keating. And joining me today we have former Cornell men's lacrosse head coach, Richie Moran. Welcome, Richie. Thank you very much. I want to talk about your first time through the NCAA tournament, the 1971 team. What was that like in leading the team in just your second season? Well, it was tremendously exciting. 1970 was a great team here at Cornell. But at that time, they voted on a national champion by a committee. And the committee consisted of seven people from the southern area and one from the northern area. So we did not get considered, <laughs> even, though, even though we were undefeated, uh, led the country in offense and defense, and it was really a great team. Some of those players came back in 1971, and we really didn't set the goal of winning a national championship because that was going to be the first year. Our goal was to win the Ivy League title, and our goal worked out very nicely. We won the Ivy League title. There were no automatic qualifiers in those days, so it was based on your ranking. And if I'm not mistaken, I think we were ranked eighth and had an opportunity to get into the NCAA playoffs. And by getting the NCAA playoffs, it gave us a chance to have a home game. We played Brown. Brown and Cornell rivalry is always very fierce and, and very competitive. And that game wound up 10-8, and it enabled us to go on to our next game, which was at West Point uh, against Army, who was undefeated and ranked number one in the country. So um, it, it was particularly exciting that week because we had very hot weather here in preparation uh, for that game, and our team was in great condition. And I think the conception was that hot weather, we might have a problem up at West Point. It was a turf field. So consequently, it wasn't uh, something that a lot of teams were used to in those days because there weren't many turf fields. But uh, our conditioning and our enthusiasm was outstanding. In fact, believe it or not, that was the day that uh, President Nixon reviewed the Corps of Cadets. So um, as the game's progressing, um, very tight game, one goal each way for about three quarters. Army went up by two in the fourth quarter. And just before the fourth quarter was about halfway through, we heard a big roar in the stands, <laughs> and it was obvious that President Nick, Nixon had driven wow. in to Mikey Stadium and uh, had gotten out of the car. Now, we had no idea he was there, and we couldn't figure out, is this an Army secret weapon, or who is that? <laughs> and we didn't really find out until after the game. But as the game progressed, it came down, believe it or not, to a ground ball. The score was 16-16. Um, Bobby Shore split in between two Army defenders, picked the ball up, threw it upfield, Jimmy Skeen caught it on a dead run. He then passed it to Glenn Mueller. Glenn Mueller hit Al Rimmer on a fly, 17-16 final, wow. with about uh, 35 seconds to go in the game. It, it was a magnificent game because, you know, a lot of people say 17-16, what kind of defense was that? Well, believe it or not, the uh, All-American team that year consisted of a defenseman from Army and John Burnett from Cornell, who also was a recipient of the Schmeiser Awards, the outstanding defenseman in the country. And John got it a young man by the name of Tom Caffaro. Tom Caffaro, believe it or not, had seven goals that game. But wow. the goals were really earned. <laughs> and uh, it, it was a magnificent performance by our team. So we held out. The conditioning was great. Huge crowd, probably about 18,000. And in, in those days, that was a pretty big crowd. So uh, 18,000 of probably 16,000 Army fans. And uh, it, it developed nicely for us. And we went on to uh, play Maryland. And that game was played in uh, uh, Rhode Island at uh, Brown Stadium. And uh, it, was, it was quite a thrill. Uh, graduation was that week, so some of our players stayed back to graduate. And uh, they flew up to uh, Rhode Island. And I think uh, after that flight, they would rather have been on the bus. <laughs> but uh, that morning, we had breakfast. And it was also during the year of um, campaigning, political campaigning. And uh, Governor Brown happened to be at the same hotel we're at. And believe it or not, I think we had more coverage at our breakfast than he had at his press conference. <laughs> uh, Jake O'Neill, by the way, was uh, a very outspoken individual for us, and he sort of led the campaign for the Cornell team with the newsmen. <laughs> but uh, it, it was great. And that game went on to uh, a double overtime victory for us. Uh, we were down 7-2 at halftime. Uh, it was very warm, which was great. And uh, Maryland was uh, undefeated. We were undefeated. In fact, the game was covered by Frank Gifford on uh, ABC Sports, and uh, it, it was really exciting because at halftime, our locker room was uh, sort of like a, uh, <laughs> a very, very small area, very heated, so we didn't stay in the locker room long, <laughs> and I think Maryland was stunned when they came out and saw us on the field already. I think they thought that uh, Cornell being down 7-2 was probably already packing their bags and ready to go home, but we had no intentions of doing that. Uh, we got ahead. Um, 
10-9, and uh, Maryland came down to feel with the ball. And this is something that's still in uh, lacrosse, um, <laughs> lacrosse history. Frank Ursa was an All-American midfielder and a great shooter. Uh, Bobby Hendrickson was a great athlete for us. In those days, we had dual athletes. We had a lot of players that played football, lacrosse, soccer lacrosse, hockey lacrosse. In fact, uh, basketball and lacrosse. So Bobby, being an outstanding athlete, both in basketball and football, got at Urso. Urso had one assist that day. Well, the Maryland bench had no timeouts. It was 30 seconds left. They had gotten the ball back. And um, their assistant coach jumped up to the scores table, grabbed the scorekeeper, and told Maryland, has, has, excuse me, Cornell has 12 players on the field. Uh, sound a horn. So the kid panicked, hit the <laughs> horn. And uh, in fact, Chris Be uh, Behrman was a PA announcer. So that tells you a little bit about wow. how this game has yeah. progressed. But um, the horn went, the flag went up in the air and down. They took a shot, hit the pipe, came back, and Mike French set the midline, picked the ball up. We thought the game's over. It's all ball. It's unsportsmanlike kind of call against Maryland. No such luck. Officials felt that uh, they didn't have enough evidence that that was an unsportsmanlike call, even though the scorekeeper found that, <laughs> that it was. So we decided not to even go on the field. So I told the players, you just sit down on the bench. And with that, the game management person from the NCAA came down and said, you know, you can't protest an NCAA game. I said, it's fine. He said, well, aren't you going to go back on the field? I said, not until those referees have a better indication of what just occurred. And they came over and said, well, you know, there's only eight seconds, nine seconds left. I said, I couldn't care if there's four seconds. A lot of things can happen in nine mm -hmm. seconds. Well, they gave the ball to Maryland at the restraining line, not at the midfield line. Urso came down. We told our players not to slide off anybody. One of our players got anxious. Our theory was that if Urso was going to his right and it looks like he's going to get an open shot, I wanted Bobby Henderson to tackle him. Because if he tackled <laughs> him, the ball goes down loose and the clock keeps running. And by the time possession's made, the game's over. Right. Well, he goes to his right and one of our guys slides. Urso throws the ball to a guy, puts it in the top corner with six seconds to go, ties the game up. So, of course, uh, <laughs> Got to get ready for overtime. And uh, in those days, it was two overtimes. Maryland came out, scored immediately. But luckily, we had a second overtime. We scored three goals in the second overtime to win. Wow. So it was, a, it was quite a thrill, quite a thrill. So what was it like for you to take over for an iconic and successful Cornell coach as you did with Ned Harkness? And, and looking now at, at Coach DeLuca in his first season as the coach at Cornell taking over for, for Jeff Tambroni. Well, you know, originally I came here to, to work in football and lacrosse. Uh, my wife actually picked this job. I was in the <laughs> military at the time and interviewed. Uh, I was coaching in high school and I was away on uh, two week uh, military maneuvers and uh, came up for an interview and it worked out very nicely. But I was finding all reasons not to come here. And my wife thought it would be a good, good move. So unbeknownst to me, she came up and looked at houses. She's pretty cocky, I think, <laughs> thinking I was going to get the job. Well, it worked out that I got the job and uh, the position was actually uh, assistant football freshman coach and assistant lacrosse coach. Uh, in fact, working with Ted Thorne. And uh, the interesting feature about that is that uh, I couldn't get up here until October because I had a commitment. I was a director of athletics at a high school on Long Island and also coaching. I just didn't feel it was right to leave in the beginning of August. So I didn't get up here until October. So I did do some scouting for football, did some recruiting, and. Uh, when I got an opportunity to get into the program itself, it was more like November. And uh, then in February, the opportunity came up to be the head lacrosse coach. And I pretty much leaned in that direction, even though football was sort of th something I was pretty enthused about. But in a way, it worked out nicely because I think most, mo a lot of football coaches have a tendency to move often. And I'm glad that I didn't have to move. <laughs> so how do you take a program like Cornell's and then make it your own? And now you look at what's been going on with Cornell Lacrosse since you, you retired. There's been a legacy of success here that's been fostered from the very beginning. What does that mean to you? It means a lot. You know, when I first got here, uh, we had to offset scholarships that other schools had. And one of the things we did, we relied a lot on the alumni, former players. We got summer jobs for our players. We got jobs during the intercession. And we got opportunities for them to get jobs upon graduation. So. I didn't like the word recruiting. When I was recommending Cornell to parents, I could sort of tell them that if they got into Cornell, they're going to guarantee, I'll guarantee them they're going to graduate. And upon graduation, I'm going to guarantee they're going to have a job. 
And I said, do many schools give you that guarantee other than <laughs> a, a signed scholarship? Well, it really worked out well because we've got a lot of quality players come to Cornell. And once you got one or two, then people want to follow. And then we set up a network for jobs. And a lot of these players in the summer were making fairly good salaries and enable them to offset the financial burden that their parents were going to have by not taking an athletic scholarship. Believe it or not, we had 26 players that had male jobs on campus. They either watched, washed pots and pans, waited on tables, and, and did the whole gamut that would normally be not looked at today as something that was exciting. <laughs> I don't think you could tell a lacrosse player here at Cornell <laughs> how about a meal job or wash pots and pans. But it worked out well. And that sort of built a great family because all these players realized they were all in the same boat doing the same thing to accomplish, number one, a great education, and two, get involved in Cornell University itself as far as the environment and also play sport or sports that they particularly enjoyed. You mentioned the Cornell lacrosse family. What does it mean to you to have so many players that come back are still in touch? I mean, just a few weeks ago, the 1971 team was back on the field with very good attendance for the, for the Princeton game. Can you describe what that Cornell lacrosse family is? Well, you know, we had a newsletter here that started back probably the year before I got here, and then we increased the size of it. So we kept everybody in, ta in touch. You know, we honored the teams in the 20s, honored the teams in the 30s. So those men were pretty proud of the fact that people hadn't forgotten them. In fact, I was at a funeral uh, just recently, and there were four lacrosse players from 1950 there. And they said, Coach, you know, we never lost sight of our feelings for Cornell lacrosse. Newsletter, opportunity to come back to campus, opportunity to follow, follow the team. One guy lived in San Diego, and he said, you know, when Cornell got on television in a 1971 championship game, what a thrill that was for us to, to get a chance to see that. And then in 76, to see you beat the number one team in the country, uh, that was even more thrilling. So the family aspect has, has always been there. And, you know, when people talk about family, they, they, they think only parents. Well, believe it or not, the community is a family. I mean, the following we have in this community is outstanding. Uh, before games started getting on television, uh, my biggest emphasis here was when I first got here was to build our schedule up, play Johns Hopkins, play Navy, play Army, play the top teams in the country, play Maryland. And uh, Bob Kane, God rest his soul, remarkable athletic director, I went into his office and he said, Richie, he said, uh, do you really want to play these teams? And I said, you know, Mr. Kane, we, we have such a great academic success here at Cornell. I think we could do the same thing in lacrosse, but we're going to have to play bigger and better teams. And sure enough, we did. And um, 1976, we played Hopkins here before 19,000 people. And our, our attendance for games was outstanding. Our rivalries with Hobart, Syracuse, uh, were just outstanding games and very well attended. So the community engrossed the program. In fact, the other night, I was looking up in the stands, and there was a gentleman there who was 84 years of age. He's never missed a home game since I got here. Wow. I mean, that's astonishing. Wow. Never missed a home game. And he's been to some away games. So that tells you a little bit about the spirit. And it's been carried on by Dave Petromala, Jeff Tambroni, and Ben DeLuca. And I don't think it ever, ever stopped, you know, because... You know, when you get a chance to bring the players back on campus, and they come back on their own, and it's remarkable how much love and feeling that these players had for Cornell. On this team right now, there are players that played for me that have sons on his team. Jimmy Feely played for me at Manhattan High School. Mm -hmm. Max Feely's his son. Then you have Cody Levine. John Levine played on the 76 championship team. Shane O'Neill, Jake O'Neill played on the 76 championship team. My, uh, Joe Taylor, Matt Taylor, the son, played, played with us in the 80s. Uh, excuse me, in the 70s, played on a championship team in 77. Kenny Enneman played in the 80s. Connor's here. So, you know, it's just, just a remarkable thing. Veronica Lizio is playing on a women's team. Joe Lizio was an outstanding player for us. So that says something about Cornell University. You know, if a father and a mother want their sons and daughters to come here, it's very obvious something happened that was really wonderful for them while they were here. You mentioned Ted Thorne earlier and with his recent passing. Can you reflect a little on your time with him and as a contemporary coach here? You know, Ted, Ted did an awful lot here, a tremendous amount. Uh, he had a freshman football team that was undefeated. And believe it or not, 
at his wake and his funeral, every player on that team was back. Wow. I mean, that's astounding. Wow. That's astounding. He had baseball players come back, Tom McLeod. Uh, and in those days, as I mentioned, there was a lot of dual athletes, fellows that played football, baseball. And, you know, we shared a lot of facilities. We had an area here where the parking garage is built by the stadium that was called Bacon Cage. And it was really designed for track. We had remarkable track teams here in the early 1900s and still have them. I mean, we have them today also. But in the 1900s with uh, uh, Mr. Moakley as the track coach, they had an indoor facility for the hammer throw, javelin, shot put. Well, we used to use that for practice, and we shared it. And um, Ted had a pitcher's mound right in the middle of it. <laughs> and I was always trying to convince him to do what they did in Houston, get a portable mound, but we could never <laughs> do that. But uh, he was a great coach of, coach of fundamentals, did a great job with his teams. And, um, you know, a dual sport coach, it's, it's, it's tough duty. I mean, if you tell a coach today that he's going to coach <laughs> two sports, it, he'll look at you and think that there's something's wrong. But uh, in those days, people did coach two and some even more than two sports. But uh, Ted was a remarkable ambassador for Cornell, very well liked all over the world. He did baseball clinics in um, various parts of the world, and, and that was really nice. So I want to get you out of here on this. How has Ivy League lacrosse, Cornell lacrosse, and the sport of college lacrosse in general changed from when you got into coaching here at Cornell in the, early, in the late 60s and early 70s up through now? What's been the biggest change that you see? Well, I, I, I think we have more respect. You know, we, uh, respect is important in athletics. Uh, the program has a tremendous amount of respect. Winning definitely helps that, but competing at a high level also reinforces that. Uh, we may lose some games, but we lose being extremely competitive. And the Ivy League has gained a lot of respect for that. You know, some tremendous athletes have come into the Ivy League and have played lacrosse here. You look at the USA team, you look at the uh, Box Lacrosse Championship teams, you look at the uh, pro teams, there's Ivy League players sprinkled all over those groups. And they're all quality people. You know, if you put an Ivy League all-star team together of this year or last year, I don't think a team in the country could beat them. You know, it's, they're so well balanced. You look at Harvard's outstanding players, Brown, Yale. You look at the competition in the uh, Ivy League tournament. Uh, you know, Penn came in with some pretty good credentials, and Harvard, you know, dismantled them. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's great to say. I have a great feeling for the Ivy League. You know, someone asked me, uh, what kept me in the Ivy League? Well, what kept me in the Ivy League was, number one, we didn't have scholarships. I think I might have a little difficult time dealing with scholarship players. <laughs> number two, we had players that really enjoyed playing. Our facilities in the early 70s, we worked out in the evenings in the polo barns as a very cultivating location, okay? <laughs> our polo team and our horses were kept in the polo barns. And we worked out at 11 o'clock at night. Now, academically, we did much better at that time because everybody got their studying done. And we'd work out in segments. Um, some players came at five foot eight, left here at six foot three. So it must've been the polo barns that was cultivating. <laughs> but uh, it was an exciting experience. You take a young man that's played at, uh, on a golf course green uh, at his high school. And February 1, when we moved into the polo bonds, uh, the first thing he's given is a uh, spade or a shovel to uh, <laughs> make sure the surface is uh, playable. And uh, we never missed any ground balls. <laughs> and uh, no one ever got a respiratory problem or a cold. So it's obvious that helped us become a better team. But all those little things helped. Um, you know, Virginia is on our schedule and has been on for a couple of years. We booked Virginia in uh, 1970. And uh, that was our first game. And we were down in Florida training and played against the Air Force Academy, Duke, and Maryland down in Florida in uh, scrimmages. Came up to Virginia and uh, they had rain. And believe it or not, they called the game off. It's the first time I've ever had a game ever <laughs> called off. I said, we would stay there for two days. But they said, no, the game's canceled. And they canceled it at like 7 o'clock in the morning. So in 71, we had an opportunity to make amends. But if we had played Virginia in 70, I think... Uh, I don't think I feel if players would have been successful and beat them. It's great to hear your mem memories and perspective on an, on an incredible coaching okay. career here. And as I said, you said great because we have a slogan. We never had any decals and all that stuff over helmets, but we always had a verbal slogan, it's great to be here. And that all started one day when we were out practice. We had sleet, rain, and snow. And we got the team together and they thought we were going to go inside. It was really interesting because in those days, 
icicles would form on that face mask <laughs> because of the perspiration and mm -hmm. the cold. And uh, all I told him was look up and told him it was great to be here. And that's been a slogan ever since. It's great for you to be here. Thanks so Thanks much for Dan. joining us. Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching Sidelines. Tune in next week. Let's go red.